Okay, so let me, I'm going to start with a question. Uh, we're in this series, it's so practical as we look at pre-deciding. And I want to ask a question because it really makes you to evaluate where you stand, where you believe, what you think. And so here's the question. If you could choose a one-word goal that you would like to achieve in your life, what one word would you choose? One-word goal that would represent your character, that would represent your nature, that would summarize what you stand for in life, what word would you choose? Now, there's a survey, and this was asked to a number of people, and there were a number of words that came. I'll tell you the popular ones. The popular ones, and we'll put it on the screen, is one of the popular words where we, the one word I'd want to signify my life is successful. Someone else said, no, I'd like to be influential. Another person said, oh, well, I want to be happy. And those are good words. I mean, I'd like to be successful. Because I believe the Bible says that we call to prosper. And my prayer is that we would succeed and we would see victory and we would see breakthrough and we would see ourselves established as individuals and as a community. And then there's influential. You know, we all want to be uh, influencers for the kingdom. It's a great kingdom word. We call to be salt and light and we call to be ambassadors. And so it's a great word. And some other people said, well, you know what? I don't want to just be influential. I want to be happy. It's another good word we see in Scripture about what it means to be blessed, what it means to be content, what it means to be fulfilled. And so these are great words. But I want to say that I believe that there's one word that in God's eyes stands out above all the rest when we look at uh, what would be the thing that burns on his heart. Because Jesus describes and he says, and he describes this moment where God's going to say something and he's not going to say, well done, my good and successful servant. He's not going to say, well done, my good and influential servant. Some of us think we need to be influential for the king in the kingdom, and we're pursuing that. He's not going to say that. He's not going to say, well done, my good and happy servant. But what Jesus is going to do is what's going to be said. And we know that we are sons, and we know that we are daughters, but we are sons and daughters that choose to be laid down, servant-hearted lovers in terms of people and God. And so there's something of a servant-hearted nature where it will be said to us, well done, my good and faithful servant. And so the word that I want to look at today is this word faithful, and the title is one word that will change your life. So let me just pray. Father, I thank you that as we come today, I thank you for the, the power of your spirit, Holy Spirit, that you are here and you're moving. I thank you for the truth of your word. I thank you for the grace that we have in you. I pray that you would stir us and motivate us and empower us to be those who are full of faith, who are faithful because you are a faithful God in all that we do, and we pray that in Jesus' name. So we're talking about pre-decide, and we're looking at how important decisions are. And one of the reasons we're looking at this is because some of us aren't great decision makers, and we can see that in our lives. Because as we've said, the quality of your decisions determines the quality of your life. And so we're looking and we saying, what does it mean to pre-decide? So that when we hit that situation or that scenario that we seem to repeatedly hit, that's like the hurdle that's catching us on the forehead, Whenever we're faced with this situation, that situation, your situation, whenever we're faced with that, we have pre-decided that we're going to take a certain action. And we have decided we're not waiting till we're in the middle of that moment to make some brash, impulsive, um, emotional response to what's happening, but rather we're going to go to the truth of God's Word, His promises, His principles, and we are going to respond in that moment having pre-decided that we are going to uh, respond in a way that honors God. And, so, and that pleases him. So this is the series we're in, and there's six areas that we're looking at. Yes, generosity will be later. But uh, this, these are the areas. We are saying, because we see this as the attributes of God's heart, we see this as his character, and we get to reflect the goodness of that. We don't only have to stand and just behold the wonder of who he is, but we get to reflect that. And so we have said this, we are going to be ready. We can put that um, diagram up, thank you, of that circle. Thank you, Brandon. We've decided we are going to be ready. We are going to be consistent. We are going to be devoted. We are going to be generous. We're going to be faithful, and we are finishers. We're not just starting this thing to get tired and to give up halfway and say, you know what, I'm out. No, we are finishers. We're going to see the culmination of what we are called to in God. And so today's the theme of faithfulness. And we look at what does it mean? How do we pre-decide to be faithful? We're just going to investigate that a little bit because here's the thing. We are never accidentally going to be consistently faithful. That's why we're pre-deciding. You are never accidentally just going to be consistently faithful. 
It's a decision, it's a posture, it's a disposition, it's a stance, it's an attitude, it's an approach to life in God that we are looking to make. And there's no way, day in, day out, week in, week out, month in, month out, decade in, decade out, that we are going to be consistent, faithfully, without intentionality. So we want to be intentional about our relationship, about the things of God, and how we live a life that pleases Him. And it's difficult. And the reason we find it difficult to be faithful is because we often find ourselves on a trajectory in life toward that which is easy. We're on this trajectory towards that which is convenient. And being faithful, faithful to God, and living in a way that pleases Him and delights Him, that's not easy in the world that we live in. It's really easy. It's often hard. It comes with a cost, but it's completely worth it. And so we're going to investigate this, as I said. We're going to jump into the Old Testament, and then we're going to springboard into the New. And so if you've got your Bibles, I'll put it on the screen. We're going to look at Habakkuk chapter 2, verse 4. And it says, look, it starts off, thank you, look at the proud. Do you know someone who's proud? If you do, put up your hand. No, don't point at them. Don't elbow them. It's family day. We want to remain friends. But, you know, we've all got an idea of who's proud. We want to investigate this for ourselves. It says, look at the proud. What do they do? He's trying to highlight this. He's trying to say, why is this dangerous? Why is this going to sabotage your walk with God? And he says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. It's saying they trust in their own wisdom, their own knowledge, their own righteousness, their own goodness, their own bank account, and their own ability. They trust in their own self-sufficiency, and they find pride in that. And he says it's dangerous because when you do this, you are not going to be walking uprightly, standing with your face beholding God. You are going to be crooked, and you are going to be bent. And he's saying watch out for this. But the, and this is the difference with the righteous. But the righteous will do what? The righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. How do you distinguish someone who is in right standing, right relationship with God, and we know that it's by faith. It's not something you can achieve, and it's by faith that we access the grace that allows us to stand rightly before God and enjoy relationship. But it says this, the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. You So often we find that in a moment, we think, you know what, I, I receive righteousness, and, and that's the end of it. No, it's, it's the start of the salvation journey. We get invited into what it means to be righteous instantly, but then we get the joy and the privilege to walk it out on a daily basis, what it means to be in right relationship, right standing with the living God, and having access to all the grace that is ours through faith in Him. And so he's saying, look at the proud, and we all suffer at times with pride. Uh, I can say all of us, I mean, I'm I'm definitely speaking to myself, but I'm sure that you're with me, where we think, you know, I'm going to do it on my own. I'm going to make it happen. I can be self-sufficient. I can will myself through this. And if I can't will myself through this, I can definitely connive my way through this. And we all find ourselves in those moments. But it says, look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked. But then it says, but the righteous live by their faithfulness to God. And I want to read the message because the message Bible brings a little bit of color and life to it. I always like to look at a, 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 a literal and then a um, paraphrase that's just more understandable. And the message Bible as a paraphrase says this, but the person in right standing before God through loyal and steady believing is fully alive. They are really alive. It's saying that when we realize that we, through faith by grace, that we get to stand in right relationship with God, we know that we're going to continue in that through loyal and steady believing. It's a, it's a journey. It's not just a moment. It's a relationship. And when we walk out that relationship, we are fully and really alive. So let me ask another question. What does it mean to be faithful? This is a practical series. It's just throwing a few handles out there. But when we look at it practically, how do we live out faithfulness. We don't want to be faithless and have less. We want to be faithful because of it, uh, knowing that it comes from the, the, the faithfulness of God, and we get to be full of faith because of that. But how do we actually live that out? Some of us might say, well, don't cheat on your tax- taxes. Don't cheat SARS. Don't cheat on your spouse. Don't cheat on um, whatever it might be. You can fill it in. Just try and be a good person. And you know, that sounds right, and that's good. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. But Jesus looked at faithfulness from a different angle than we, would other, uh, than we would think in other times. He brings a different perspective. 
And actually, if you do a Bible study on what Jesus said about faith, there are three categories. And all the times he mentioned faithfulness, there were three categories to which he mentioned it. And there were only three categories that he spoke about faithfulness. Let me tell you what they are. He talked about faithfulness and how you treat pe people. This is how you're faithful. He says faithfulness is seen in how you treat people. Faithfulness is how you steward resources. And faithfulness is how you respond to God. So he's saying faithfulness looks like this. It looks like something in your relationships with people. It looks like something in how you take care of your resources. Faithfulness looks like something in how you respond to God. So in response to these values that Jesus is revealing to us on faithfulness, we're going to look at three areas, and we're going to pre-decide on three things. That's what we're going to do today before when we go have fun on the grass and the jumping castles. Well, some of us under a certain height and weight category. The rest of us, we get to cheer them on. The first thing that we're going to pre-decide is this. Every interaction is an opportunity to add value. Every interaction is an opportunity to add value. Our second decision is this, because... The first one is, it's about relationship. The second is this, every resource is an opportunity to multiply. Every resource you have is an opportunity to see multiplication because Jesus defines faithfulness as taking care of that which he's entrusted to you. Number three, every prompting is an opportunity to obey God. Every time God prompts you, it's an opportunity. What a privilege to have this opportunity. It's not something that you're obligated to, it's an opportunity for you to step into, to obey God. So he says it's about treating people, stewarding things, and responding to God. So let's look at the first one. Every interaction is an opportunity to add value. This means that we pre-decide something. And what we pre-decide is that wherever we go, with whomever we meet, every moment is an opportunity to bless. It's an opportunity to encourage. It's an opportunity to be generous. It's an opportunity to add value. I mean, that shifts the way you're going to engage with people. That shifts the way you're going to shop. That shifts the way you're going to do family moments. It shifts, it, it shifts the way I'm going to travel on an airplane uh, and wait in uh, terminals and all of that that goes with us. We pre-decide that every person we engage with is an opportunity for us to show the love of God and to add value to their lives because we know the value that we have in relationship of, with God in our life. And so we get to share that. And so it brings value and it brings blessing to others. And the reason that we predecide is this. It's because we never will add value consistently, accidentally. We're never going to add value to others consistently, accidentally. No, you need to be intentional, and you need to pre-decide. This is something we've got to take an attitude and a stance in, in God. And the reason we won't do that, let me be honest and let me be vulnerable and point out your issues. The reason we won't do that is because we can and I can be ridiculously focused on myself. And I don't like to share sermon without taking a moment to pick on my mother. No, I'm joking. I'll share a moment. It's not picking on you, Rose, don't worry. But my mom, my brother, and I had to film a video clip for our friends in Germany. And, uh, you know, don't go lost if you're doing one of those. Because my brother goes, no, I made a mistake, I'm going to start again. Literally about, what, at least about 20 times. Then it moved, because it's one clip, moves to my mom. And my mom, my mom's amazing. She did it in two, two. I think it was two. Very, very good. It gets to me. They're not going to afford me any more time. We've been doing this for like 40 minutes. I do one clip, I get tongue-tied, I mess it up, too bad, it's perfect, don't worry about it. Why? Because your only reason from your part, my brother's like, no, it's fine, George, it's perfect. Why did we do 30 takes with you then? Sorry, it's a little bit of family. Why? You see the photo? Eight people in it. First person you look at is who? Your wife? Your husband? No, you look at yourself. And if you look good, it's a great photo. And if you look bad, if you're blinking, well, then your teenage son will tell you, if you post this, you do not love me anymore. <laughs> Is that right, Luke? Not really. Luke's a lot better than I am. You see, it's the same way when we interact with people. We're busy talking to them, and we're thinking, well, what are they thinking? You know, did I, did I say something wrong then? What if they don't receive what I'm saying? We walk away, and we actually land up overanalyzing uh, how the conversation went. Why? Because we're so focused on ourselves that we're not even really engaging with the person in front of us. 
And there's something about shifting this. That there's something about pulling ourselves out of self-focus so that we can be God-focused, well, God-conscious, and be people-focused. Out of self-focus into God-consciousness so that we can be people-focused to add value and bring benefit. And there's a shift that needs to take place. And it looks like this, that instead of saying, you know, will they like me when I'm in this moment? Instead of saying that, or instead of saying, how will they receive me when I come into a, a busy room? I'm not worried about how the focus is on me, but instead I know Jesus is in me. And wherever Jesus pitches up, there is life and grace and ministry and freedom and liberty and love that starts to splash out. And I start to say to myself, I'm not going to be self-focused. I'm going to be God conscious. I'm going to be people focused and say, Jesus, how do I add value? How do I bless? less? How do I encourage? How do I release generosity? How do I speak words that bring people into new, new moments of destiny with you? Ephesians 4 verse 29, and I say that because that's a form of faithfulness. How are you treating other people? Ephesians 4 verse 29 picks this up and emphasizes it. It says, don't let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only that which is helpful for building others up really for adding value what we're talking about, according to their needs, that they might benefit, that it, sorry, that your words might benefit those who listen. Uh, I want to look at a different translation. The Passion Translation just says it so beautifully. It says, but instead, saying instead of speaking these ugly words, harsh words, um, spontaneous words that you haven't thought about that do such damage. My wife often tells me this, George, that word is like a nail in a fence. You can pull it out the fence, the hole's still in the fence. I'm like, sweetie, we can tear down the fence later. It's not a problem. <laughs> Different approaches to construction. But this passage that says this, the Passion Translation. But instead of all that, let your words become beautiful gifts. I love words. I love English. I love language. I love phrases. Let your words become beautiful gifts that encourage others. Do this by speaking words of grace to help them. Your words can be beautiful gifts. They can be infused and they can be armed and dangerous, carrying grace that explodes upon every situation. What words are you speaking? Are you intentional in predeciding what you're saying or are you just responding brashly in the moment? And, and we get to be faithful to God and we get to add value. And here's the thing, when you walk into a room, you get to change the climate in that room. I don't care what room. I don't care who's in it. I don't care what the purpose of that meeting is. I don't care what's been said before. The way that you walk in as you are engaging and God conscious and you people focus and you're saying, Lord, I want to partner with your kingdom. I want to speak words that are gifts to others that are infused with grace. When you do that, you are not a, a, thermo, I mean, a thermometer walking in to read the temperature of the room. You are a kingdom thermos that that sets the atmosphere because as you walk in encouragement walks in and grace walks in and favor work walks in and mercy walks in the room and love walks in the room and blessing and you get to speak the truth and it's maybe it confronts things but you speak the truth and love and it sets people into freedom and you know that when you go into that room no matter how rough and tough it is it's going to get better because you are walking in and you're full of faith and it starts to spill over it's not going to lessen your faith but you're full of faith because of his faithfulness and because you walk in people are blessed you see you add value and that is what faithfulness to God looks like you can just look at Jesus and how he treated and responded to people you look at the disciples, and they often went through moments where they were terrified. I mean, there were ships sinking, there were demons going to beat them up, there was crazy stuff going on, and you don't ever see Jesus saying, you better be worried. You are in a lot of trouble this time, just sitting back watching them. You don't see him saying, listen, you better go and read the, the latest government report, or have you seen those petrol prices, or have you read the news today? No, you don't see Jesus saying that. Whenever you see Jesus, he's saying this, don't worry. Don't even worry about what you're going to eat and drink. Don't even worry about the clothes that you're going to wear because your heavenly father cares about you so much. He's saying he not only cares for creation, but he actually and most certainly cares about you individually and personally. And so there's this, this sense. He doesn't just leave it there. He says, here, he gives you a focus. So don't worry. Don't place your faith in what's going wrong. Place your faith in what you are pursuing. And so he says this, and we spoke about it last way, a week. Seek first the king, the kingdom, his righteousness. Don't try and seek your own righteousness. Seek first the king, his kingdom, and his righteousness. And when you do the seeking, God does the adding of everything that you need to live a God-glorifying life. You look at Jesus with the woman who sinned. 
and who was caught in adultery. You don't see Jesus saying to her, well, shame on you. you. You've been involved with despicable things and turning his back on her. No, you see him getting down and low and starting to write in the sand. And the religious leaders would have got excited because they're thinking he's picking up a rock and he's going to start stoning her. And as they peer over to say, well, that's a good rock. What about that one? They see that he's writing things in the sand. And some theologians think that he was writing out the sins that each of them would have done because they start to leave individually. Here's the beauty. He wasn't only protecting the lady and saying, I'm not going to stone her. But he was not looking them in the eye. He was writing it on the dust. So he didn't actually expose them and cause them in their judgment to need to be stoned themselves. He let them walk away with grace and freedom. And then he turns to her. And he's just shown this picture of saying, look, I don't condemn you. I'm not standing from a far off distance wanting to stone you, saying you're not good enough. I'm willing to get down low in the dust. That's what love does. And he says, where are your accusers? And she says, there, is, there are none. He said, neither do I condemn you. He never came to condemn. He came to liberate. And so he says to her, go your way and sin no more. And you think, well, she's just going to get caught in the same things. And you, we need to understand that this is a grace encounter. There is not only grace to her in the moment, but she goes with grace. That enables her to live free, to, to be liberated, and to be able to live a life that glorifies God. There's grace to you and with you. And that's why if you read in the New Testament, uh, the 13 letters that Paul writes, he always starts by saying grace to you. And then he finishes, because you finished reading it, and he says grace with you as you go. It's grace. And this is what Jesus did. He was so gracious and grace. Um, and grace giving. When you look at Peter denying Jesus, not one time, two times, three times, what did Jesus do? He didn't say, your discipleship card is revoked and canceled. No, he doesn't do that in this moment. But he says this, and I love it, because he deals with Peter's heart. You know why? Because the scriptures say, if you are faithless, he will remain faithful, because he cannot deny himself. If faithful isn't something he does, faithful is who he is. And so even when Peter is faithless, he says to Peter, he says, Peter, do you love me? Do you still love me? And then Peter responds, yes, I do. Then go and feed my sheep. He doesn't even say, Peter, well, then you should be kind to me and say nice words. No, he's faithful. This hasn't shifted him. He knows who he is. He says, Peter, go and feed my sheep. Go and do my will. Go and show my love. And there's a forgiveness and a, gr a graciousness and a graceful way in which he deals with that. He's saying, I want you. Jesus came to show the love of the Father. He said, I'm never going to leave you nor forsake you. He modeled this out on his time of, on earth. Then he says, you are going to do greater things than me because I'm never leaving. I'm even giving you my Holy Spirit. What I want you to do is live as a demonstration and expression of my love, uh, love. Every interaction is an invitation for you to show the love of God, for, to build people up, to show grace, to be a blessing. And you have no idea what a single word a God-focused, directed word can do to change someone's life. Uh, I was reading a testimony of Craig Rochelle, and many of you would know him. If you've got the version Bible app on your phone, um, that is from uh, his church. And he was talking about as he started out in ministry, he had just felt the call. And um, as a young man, he came out of professional tennis, and he went into seminary, and he was studying to be ordained through the group of churches he was with. And he came back one day to his pastor, and he was embarrassed. He was weeping his eyes out. He was crushed because he said, they rejected my ordination. He was the only person that had been rejected that he knew of, and this was in a group of churches desperate for pastors. And so he flung himself on his pastor's desk, and he said it was the full weight of his body, like he properly climbed on there, the whole body on the desk. And he, and he does this, and the pastor says to him, the pastor said to him, he looked at him, he said, listen, look at me, Craig. He said, I want to tell you something, but you've got to look at me and you've got to pay attention. And Craig is broken. He's thinking, I'm out of ministry. I can't continue. And he said this to a young Craig Rochelle, no man can stop you from doing that which God has called you to do. And there was something about the condemnation that broke off of him as the calling of God picked him up and stood him up knowing what's possible in God. But it took a man speaking a beautiful word that was as a gift of grace to Craig in that moment. What words are we speaking? Do you know that a single word can change someone's life? And that's one of the ways that we can be faithful to God is to be a blessing to people. The second thing is this. Another way we can be faithful to God, you can put it on the, on the screen. Thank you, Brandon. Number two. Every resource is an opportunity to multiply. Matthew 
25 verse 21, Jesus tells the parable of a wealthy man who's got property and resources, and he's going on a trip. So he goes to um, his servants, and he says, I'm going to give uh, five bags of gold to you. I'm going to give two bags of gold to you, and I'm going to give a bag of gold to you. And the two people who got um, the bags of gold first, the five and the two bags of gold, what they did is they worked it. They took it and they risked it, and I don't mean like at a, uh, a casino, but they, they took a calculated risk of how there could be multiplication. They risked it, they invested it, and they doubled what they had. And in verse 21, this is what the master um, of the property said to them, well done, my good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things, and I'll put you in charge of many things. Often we get that reversed. We want to be faithful with many things, so we don't do the few no, he says, you've been faithful with a few things. I'm going to put you in charge of many things. And here's, here's something that's quite significant. As you're talking about finance, but he's talking about authority. Do you see the difference? You've been faithful with this, and so I'm going to put you in charge. It's not a financial thing. It's talking about authority and stepping up in authority. And he, you multiplied what I gave you. So this is what the master's saying. You see, in the kingdom of God, that's what faithfulness looks like. It looks like multiplication of resources. And the Greek word for faithful is this. It's the word pistos. And if you look in Strong's Concordance, it's quite interesting what it conveys that it means. It says, and we can put it on the screen, it is persons who show themselves faithful in the transactions of business, the execution of commands, or the discharge of official duties. So there's something about being faithful that can even be seen in how we conduct business. And so there's something there that needs to draw our attention. And when we look at that, we realize we can be faithful to God by simply caring for that which He entrusts to us. You know, you might have a bit of a derelict garden and might be moaning about it, but maybe if you will cultivate that, it's going to show something of faithfulness that will lead you into multiplication. Maybe you've got a broken down, rusty, rattling car, and uh, you don't know how long this thing's going to last. But let me say, as you care for it, tend to it, clean it, you might have the cleanest, rusty, rattling um, car that is going down the highway. But you, you take care of it. Maybe with the body that you have, are you taking care of it? Because you want multiplied health. And there's something about multiplication that when we take care of God, uh, what God's entrusted to us, it results in it. And so when we look at this in business, a lot of Christians feel like they're second-rate citizens because they're not in full-time ministry. And if we had to say, I hope if I say who's in full-time ministry, I'm going to say, who's in full-time ministry? I, good answer, Mom. I'm glad I went over my sermon notes with you last night. <laughs> what we want everyone to know in this church is we are equipping ministers to go out and do the work of the ministry wherever you place. We are all of that. Some of us are employed full-time at the church. That might be a distinction. But there isn't this shift between sacred and secular. It's a matter of light and darkness. And so we've got to see how we approach that thing. But some feel, no, you know, I'm just a businessman. I don't work in ministry. And we can look at it, and I want to say this. Being in business and being good at business is one of the most God-honoring things that you can do. It's one of the things that are most desperate for his touch, for his innovation, for his generosity, and for his influence. That's where it needs to happen. And you, you get to do this if you're in business or own a business. You get to create something that adds value to people's lives. You get to do this. You get to model what good and godly leadership looks like. You get to lead with integrity that causes people to witness the character and the nature of God. If you're a business owner, you take that little we've been mentioning, and you risk it in faith, calculated risk in faith, so that you can see it multiply and create more jobs. And then you get to treat your employees and those, your clients, and others that you engage with, with dignity. I want to say that space is a God-glorifying, God-honoring space, and we need more businessmen and businesswomen who approach it as such. You know, it's fine to fast, it's fine to pray. I hope we're doing that. It's fine to host Bible studies, and it's fine to um, teach in Sunday school. And, and I want to say those are fine, and those are great, but it is also great to be a godly businessman, businesswoman, business person, because that models just as much faithfulness to God as fasting and praying. I've got friends here who I hear more testimony about what they're doing in the secular as they are light in that space than I do often from those involved in ministry. They've got better stories, better stories than I get to share most of the time. It is faithfulness to God. And here's a scripture that backs that up. Colossians 3 verse 23. 
Whatever may be your task, so you're looking, thinking, but this doesn't glorify God. Whatever may be your task, work at it heartily. I love this. It's the amplified version. Gives it amplification. Whatever may be your task, work at it heartily from the soul. Whatever task you're doing, work at it from your soul. That's all invested as something done for the Lord and not for men. Knowing with all certainty that this is from the Lord and not from men. And that you will receive the inheritance which is your real reward. It's saying what you do on earth, no matter what it is, if you do it from your soul as unto God, there's going to be eternal reward. It doesn't just have to be ministry or this or, or that that you think is just church activity. No, it's being the church. And often we hear today, if you've got your motivational speakers like Simon Sinek, they'll say, find your passion that makes you come fully alive. And when you do that, you're not working. I mean, that's beautiful. But there is, there's been a survey, and I can't remember the percentage. I didn't pay attention to it a moment. But there's something like 70% of people that say, I can't find my passion or operate in it. So what about me? Does it mean I don't come fully alive? And I, just, and I wanted to say this. If you can't find your passion that makes you come fully alive and do it, then do what's in front of you with the passion that you have for the one who makes you alive. And that's going to glorify him. And that's what faithfulness looks like. And then there's the other guy who's got the one bag. And he thinks, hey, you know what? I'm just going to hide the money. I, I, I'm afraid of my master. I, I don't really know him too well in his heart. And, and so because I don't really know him and I've built my own perspective of him without any reality, I'm just going to hide this money. And so he does that. And then when the master comes back, verse 20, he says this to him, I was afraid and went out and hid your gold in the ground. See, here it's what belongs to you. And his rem master replied, you wicked, we've got it on the screen, thank you. You wicked, lazy servant. Here's what I want you to see. And here's what I want you to feel as I read that. To the one who multiplied, to the one who has given something, it said, you are faithful. To the one who buried it, even what he had was taken away. And he wasn't just lazy, he was wicked. I mean, that's quite a statement when you hear that. And here's the thing. Abdicating doesn't remove accountability, it increases it. So when we think, I don't really know his heart, so I'm just going to abdicate and not get involved. That doesn't mean that you're just going to get off and it's going to go wonderfully with you. No, I want to say that's going to increase accountability because there's a day coming that you're going to need to be accountable. The beauty is that we know that in God we're accountable to that which is reward. But the challenge is if we don't know him and if we have not sought him out, or sought to engage with his kindness and the goodness of his heart, there's a reckoning in that moment as well. And so we get to choose to be faithful. That's what's modeled out here. And then lastly, let me say, every prompting is an opportunity to obey God. Acts 20 verse 22. And Paul's been ministering powerfully in Ephesus, but then something happens, and he says this emotional goodbye to the church leaders because he says, and now compelled by the Spirit, verse 22. There's a compulsion in the Spirit of God. And it's the Greek phrase, deo honuma. I've been compelled by the Spirit, deo honuma. And the word deo means compelled. It means bound. It means wrapped. And the word numa means spirit. It means current. It means breeze. So I'm compelled by the Spirit. Here's what it means. I love this description from the commentary. It's not going to be on the screen. I'm going to re read it to you. This is what it feels like when you're compelled by the Spirit, if you're wondering. It's like a rope that is pulling you because you are bound or tied to the breeze of the Holy Spirit. Don't you love that? You are bound or tied to the breeze of the Holy Spirit. And so there's this compulsion, and you can't explain it. Paul goes on to say, I'm going to Jerusalem, and I'm not knowing what will happen to me there. I can't explain it. I don't understand it. I don't know the details, but I am bound, and I am caught up, and I'm following the breeze of the Holy Spirit, no matter what it looks like. And there's something that compels him. And you see, faithfulness looks like the response to the prompting of God. Faithfulness looks like the response. Let me tell you two stories. One is with my mom, and I said a bit of a tougher one earlier, so I'm going to bolster her a bit now. But this testimony is actually my testimony. And at the age of nine months old, I had had whooping cough for a duration of time, and we were staying at the Salt Rock Cottage, and my mom and my dad were off to a funeral. Was dad doing the funeral? 
So my dad was doing a funeral. I remember when he was off to do ministry, it was like, you be in the car, we leave at that time. And uh, gracious, but firm. And, uh, and so my mom and dad were heading off. I don't remember it when I was nine months old. I later encounter anyway. Um, so my dad and mom are heading off to this funeral. And my mom just gets the sense, you need to go back to George. And they've already driven down the road. She's dressed up. My dad's doing it. They need to get there. And she says, no, Ian, I need to go back. And he's like, what are you talking about? She said, no, there's this prompting. I need to go back. And so she comes back to the Salt Rock house and the lady who was looking after me was in the kitchen and she walked through to the room and I was blue and stiff as a board. Is that correct? Said a few moments later, she thinks I would have been gone totally. She was able to pull out whooping cough, all that goes with it and get me back and get life back into me. But it was following a prompting that the Lord gave her. Here's why I want to say this. You have no, here's the spiritual principle of this story. You have no idea what God might do when you follow a prompting that he gives you. You have no idea what God will do when you follow a prompting that he gives you. Let me tell you the second story. Shane Littleton, uh, many of you know him. Brandon is doing uh, the media, it's his uncle. Shane and I traveled the UK together. And um, while we were there, we were working at Harvey Nichols. You know Harvey Nichols? It's this hugely glamorous fashion store and Lady Di and Alton John and Cliff Richards and the English soccer team, all of them would come through the different floors and shop. And uh, Shane and I were banished to the basement. Uh, we were porters, and so we, we didn't get to engage with any of that. But it sounds great. Um, but anyway, while we were in the basement at Harvey Nichols, um, opposite Harrods, Knightsbridge. What, what, uh, we had a Jamaican, she was about this tall, we had a Jamaican manager. And we, she was going through a tough time and Shane and I just felt this prompting. He said, George, I feel this prompting. I said, yeah, so do I. We need to pray for her. Okay, let's do it. We are full of faith. And we said, okay, let's go. And we tell her and she's a little bit embarrassed and she says, we can't do it. Everyone's around. So we said, okay, let's go into the closet. And so the three of us push into this tiny little closet, broom, mop, everything. And we start to pray. And Shane and I are praying our best prayer. I think we prophesying. I mean, we're crying. We, we're swaying. We're feeling the spirit moving. And she's standing there like, just checking us out. And we, we, we feel God's done something. We, we thought he, we couldn't see it, so we walk out, and then she, she just looks at us. We look at her. She walks away. We never spoke about it again, following the prompting. So what, where's the miracle? I'm actually asking you, where's the miracle? We, we didn't see a miracle. There was nothing that happened. Um, that's the story. There's no more to it than that. So what's the spiritual principle I'm saying? After the first one, there was a miracle. What, what happens in this one? Here's the spiritual principle. Obedience is our responsibility. You can put it on the screen. The outcome is God's. You follow the prompting. Obedience is our responsibility. The outcome is God's. And he is good at what he does. And so that is faithfulness. That's when we're obedient. And sometimes you'll see the reason why you're prompted and other times you won't. And you've got to have faith. You've got to understand that we get to know that God is going to put someone in our lives or he's going to ask us to say something or text something or post something or email someone or he's going to tell us to give something to someone, to bless someone. Hear what I said? I didn't say he's going to ask you to receive something. Uh, There might be that as well because some of us have to deal with the pride of not receiving. But I'm saying, what does it look like to be generous? What does it look like to be prompted? What does it look like to follow his lead? And you're going to have to pre-decide that I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to add value. I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to multiply and steward what he trusts to me. I'm going to be faithful and I'm going to obey because the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. And I want to be fully alive and loyal and steady in the way that I'm believing in him. That's the encouragement that comes. And I want to to bring one more challenge is that we're going to overestimate what God can do in the short run. We're going to overestimate what that is, and we're going to underestimate what God can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. Eugene Peterson speaks about, um, what was the title of his book, A Long Obedience in the Same Direction. And some of us, we shipwreck our faith because we're so desperate for the instant And we we get in that place where we overestimate what he's going to do in just this season because that's how we weigh it up or in this moment or in our marriage tomorrow or in our finances this week or how much we're going to grow spiritually from this Sunday to next. And so we overestimate and we get shipwrecked in our faith, but we need to realize it's the loyal, steady, long road of obedience because here's the thing, you will vastly and you will every single time underestimate what God can do through a lifetime of faithfulness. It'll be God honoring and glorifying. And so if you want to be successful, be faithful in the small things and he'll trust you with more. 
If you want to be influential, be faithful to those around you and he's going to give you more influence. If you want to be happy, stop trying to make a difference in your own life and start looking, how can I make a difference in the world? Because that starts to happen. You're going to have joy and you're going to be more than content and you're going to be blessed and fulfilled. And when God prompts, say yes, because obedience is your responsibility. The outcome is his. Let me pray. Father, I just want to thank you that we can come to you. And even as we speak about what it means to be faithful, we thank you that faithful is who you are. And we can be full of faith as we look at you and walk with you and live out of relationship with you. And I just thank you that you come and you just stir a desire in our hearts just to experience that in a deeper measure. Lord, I thank you for that loyal, that trustworthy, that steady, ongoing walking and relationship of faith and believing and accessing more and more of your grace, what that looks like. I thank you, Lord, that some of us might be in the place where we realize that we haven't been faithful. But Lord, even where we fall short, you are always faithful. And we thank you that you will never leave nor forsake. But as we come and we confess our sins, you are faithful to forgive, to cleanse, to grace, to pour out mercy, favor, give us identity and a destiny in you. So we come and we just submit ourselves to you afresh today. And we want to say individually and as a people, we choose to be a faithful people people of faith. In Jesus' mighty name we pray, and together we say, amen.